and you should have received an email reminder um, that sort of refreshed your memory about um, how to find the recording and, and the syllabus and also to uh, refresh your memory about the link, which is yours individually to use. Um, so we're go going to do things a little bit differently this time. Um, we have set this up so that you won't be able to unmute yourself because um, last time we had some people who, who um, I, I don't know, it just wasn't working and, and it, was, it was giving Roxanne a lot of feedback and that's very hard to deal with. Um, until at some point, Roxana will say um, that you can unmute yourselves now so we can have a conversation, but we'll also continue to use the chat room. Um, and also because of a glitch, a lot of you are named Kara Weigold instead of your own name. It has to do with somehow how the email came through. So if you'd like to rename yourself, just please feel free to do that. Um, so are we ready to go? It's two minutes after Roxana, are you ready to go? I'm all ready. Okay, good. I'm going to mute myself then. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. And I'm glad we can start on time this week. Um, I'm so happy to see so many faces that I recognize and your names. Hi, Lorene. Hi, Anne. Hi, Betty. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm delighted to be um, once again talking about Anna Karenina, one of the great books. And um, what else? So um, if you have something that you want to talk about, please put it into the chat. Um, also feel free to say hello and, and put, put up your name so that everyone can see who's here. Um, and as I asked last week, if you write down, if you put something, a note in the margin saying, this is something I'd like to discuss, it confuses me, it, it, it elates me, it disgusts me, anything you want to say, um, let me know about that, put that in the chat. Um, I'm also gonna let you know that I'm, I'm going to extend the sessions by 15 minutes. I just think one hour is, is not enough time to get through 100 pages of one of the greatest novels ever written. Um, if you have to leave early, these are recorded so you can watch the last 15 minutes, but I think that will give us a little more space. Okay, so Anna Karenina, part one. I wanted to give you a quote from Larissa Volokonsky, one of the translators of this edition. And um, I, I just wanted to give you a sense of Russia, Russian literature in the 19th century. And she says, the unusual thing about Russia is that it reached cultural maturity in the middle of the 19th century. Russia didn't have the middle ages of Dante and Chaucer, the Renaissance of the Italians, or the Elizabethan age of the British. They didn't have Shakespeare. They weren't even sure what language to write in. Imagine living in a country in which that was true. 11 time zones, hundreds of dialects, um, French being the language of the aristocrats, um, Russian being something that sometimes was déclassé to use, sometimes it was patriotic, um, and there was no Russian literature. She said, um, Pushkin, more or less created the Russian literary language and Pushkin was born in 1799. That's very late to start off. And he died in 1837. But the, but the 19th century was a, a tremendous flowering of literature in Russia. So Tolstoy was sort of on a wave and remember the, the great Russian writers of the 19th century, um, Turgenev who preceded Tolstoy, um, Dostoevsky of course who was contemporary, Chekhov who's a bit later, but they really got going once they started. But this was more or less the beginning for Russia. Now everybody is, it's, um, I'm seeing the Cornwall Library instead of faces. So if you can show me your face, I appreciate that. I guess that's just Sherry and Margaret. Um, okay, so Pushkin started Russian literature. And remember I told you last week about Pushkin that he was, um, what he did was to, to deliver the stories that Russians had already learned at their at the knee of their nurse or their grandmother. There were many fairy tales and folk tales. They were kind of countryside dramas that Russians knew, but they had never been written down. And Pushkin was a great writer. I don't mean to say he just, he simply transliterated stories. He was a wonderful writer, but these stories were full of the idea of the Russian countryside. They were melodramatic full of action and activity. 
And um, so they provided a base for Russians to use to launch themselves into the, the 19th century literary sort of festival that they created. Now Pushkin has something to do in particular with this book. The story is, which his wife, um, Tolstoy's wife put in her journal, that Tolstoy started writing Anna Karenina. It was in the late 1870s. He'd already written War and Peace. He started writing this book. He was trying to find something to write and he saw a fragment by Pushkin. And here's the fragment. The guests arrived at the country house. That was the beginning of a story or, a, or of a novel by, by Pushkin that was never finished. But the idea of starting off a whole book with a phrase like that, which eliminates exposition, was something that seized Tolstoy. The idea that you don't start off by saying, um, the rector of Barset lived in a small stone house near the main square of Barsetshire close. You start off with action and you, you allow the reader to make up the scene because you've already started. You're already entering into this, this scene of enormous activity. So that's what seized Tolstoy's imagination and his this sense of excitement. And so that's what he does in this book. And I'm gonna do some readings from part one. And I want you to consider several things, three things. And one, there are things that sort of inhabit this book. One is velocity, one is intensity, and one is empathy. And these three things are things that Tolstoy excelled at, and they really make this book into something that is almost unique in, in, in literature. I'm gonna use a lot of um, expressions about Tolstoy. I love this book. So I, I'll tell you all sorts of, I'll use or, um, tell you it's the greatest book ever. But anyway, um, these three things, these three characteristics are really um, extraordinary presences in this book. Velocity, intens intensity, and empathy. So I'm gonna read the first couple of pages to remind you of how this book starts out. Um, all happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. All was confusion in the Oblonsky's house. The wife had found out that the husband was having an affair with their former French governess and had announced to the husband that she could not live in the same house with him. The situation had continued for three days now and was painfully felt by the couple themselves as well as by all the members of the family and household. They felt that there was no sense in their living together and that people who meet accidentally at, at any inn have more connection with each other than they, the members of the family and household of the Oblonskys. The wife would not leave her room. The, the husband was away for the third day. The children were running all over the house as if lost. The English governess quarreled with the housekeeper and wrote a note to her friend asking her to find her a new place. The cook had already left the premises the day before at dinner time. The kitchen maid and coachman had given notice. On the third day after the quarrel, Prince Stepan Arkadyevich, Arkadyevich Oblonsky, Steva, as he was called in society, woke up at his usual hour, that is at eight o'clock in the morning, not in his wife's bedroom, but in his study on a Morocco so sofa. We're gonna see that sofa later, but now we don't know it. He rolled his full, well-tended body over on the springs of the sofa, as if wishing to fall asleep again for a long time, tightly hu hugged the pillow from the other side and pressed his cheek to it. But suddenly he gave a start, sat up on the sofa and opened his eyes. Yes, how did it go? He thought, recalling his dream. How did it go? Yes, Alabin was giving a dinner in Darmstadt. No, in Darmstadt, but something American. Yes, but this Darmstadt was in America. Yes, Alabin was giving a dinner on glass plates. Yes, yes, it was very nice. I'm skipping a bit. Um, and noticing a, a strip of light that had broken through the side of one of the heavy blinds, he cheerfully dropped his feet from the sofa, felt for the slippers trimmed with gold Morocco that his wife had embroidered for him. And following a nine-year-old habit without getting up, reached his hand out to the place where his dressing gown hung in the bedroom. And here he suddenly remembered how and why he was sleeping 
not in his wife's bedroom, but in his study. The smile vanished from his face and he knitted his brows. Oh, 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 he moaned, remembering all that had taken place. And in his imagination, he again pictured all the details of his quarrel with his wife, all the hopelessness of his position, and most painful of all, his own guilt. No, she won't forgive me and can't forgive me. And the most terrible thing is that I'm the guilty one in it all. Guilty and yet not guilty. That's the whole drama, he thought. Oh, 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 he murmured with despair, recalling what were for him the most painful impressions of this quarrel. Worst of all had been that first moment when coming back from the theater, cheerful and content, holding a huge pear for his wife, he had not found her in the drawing room. To his surprise, he had not found her in the study either, and had finally seen her in the bedroom with the unfortunate, all revealing note in her hand. She, this pre eternally preoccupied and bustling, and as he thought, not none too bright Dolly, was sitting motionless, the note in her hand, looking at him with an expression of horror, despair, and wrath. What is this? This, she asked, pointing to the note. And in recalling it, as often happens, Stepan Arkadyevich was tormented, not so much by the event itself, as by the way he had responded to these words from his wife. What had happened to him at that moment was what happens to people when they are unexpectedly caught in something very shameful. He had not managed to prepare his face for the position he found, found himself in with regard to his wife now that his guilt had been revealed. Instead of being offended or denying or justifying, asking forgiveness, even remaining indifferent, any of which would have been better than what he did, his face, quite involuntarily smiled all at once in its habitual, kind, and therefore stupid smile. That stupid smile he could not forgive himself. Seeing that smile, Dolly had winced as if from physical pain, burst with her typical vehemence into a torrent of cruel words and rushed from the room. Since then, she had refused to see her husband. That stupid smile is to blame for it all, thought Stepan Arkadyevich. But what to do then? What to do, he kept saying despairingly to himself. And he could find no answer. Okay, so this is a great beginning. There is no exposition. We were told nothing about Dolly and Stepan except their feelings. This is a, the bo a book that opens with an emotional landscape. We know about the Morocco, um, the sofa, the study, the slippers, but basically this is an emotional terrain that has been laid out for us. And it's very powerful. Stepan's emotions dominate, and his wife, Dolly, dominate the, the scene. And we're told in the very beginning, the whole household has gone crazy. And everything in the circles around Dolly and Stepan is reflecting that. The governess is, is giving notice. This, the cook has already quit. The coachman is about to quit. So the whole household is falling apart because of Stepan. So we learn more and more about Stepan in the opening chapters. And I would ask you to examine your feelings about Stepan because what Tolstoy is doing is something quite sophisticated and complicated. He's setting up a moral conundrum. And for Tolstoy, morality and integrity really are kind of a, a, a moral authenticity more than a set of rules that you abide by, but a sense of yourself. So it um, is very, very important to Tolstoy. And we're gonna see that in this book. Tolstoy examines the, the integrity, the, the interior, um, truthfulness of these characters. And that more than abiding by society's rules or abiding by God's rules, the church's rules, that sense of inner integrity, the sense of being accountable to yourself, responsible for your actions to yourself, 
is really important to Tolstoy. And so we see that throughout this book. We see these characters answering to themselves. And those interior moments are something that um, is, is part of a new kind of writing. And so Tolstoy was kind of the originator or the precursor of what we call stream of consciousness in modernism. So we see it later um, in Proust and Virginia Woolf and James Joyce, but Tolstoy was really doing this early. This is the late 1870s. He is entering into the interior, the, the consciousness of his characters, and he lets us just flow through their thoughts. Sometimes they're interspersed with dialogue. Sometimes we're just inside that character. And Tolstoy does this with such um, intensity, with such precision, with such attentiveness, that we feel that we know these characters, that we inhabit these characters. And we inhabit the character of Stepan, Steva. I call him Steva because we're very close. Um, and Steva, as we know from the very outset, is a, is a bounder, he's a cad. He has done something really inexcusable. He's had an affair with the former governor of, his, of the household, the woman who looked after his children. So talk about violating a moral trust. He has done that. And so, and yet I would ask you um, whether or not you can feel sympathy for Steva because I myself feel great sympathy for him. Um, what Tolstoy does in this is present Steva as someone who is um, incredibly self-centered. He's Ir irresponsible, and we'll see that he's he's that person throughout the book. Um, he's selfish, and yet he's never cruel. He's completely good natured, and he's benevolent. So we see him not only in this early scene with Dolly, when he's horrified to realize that he's caused her pain, he himself starts to cry. Um, he's shattered that he has destroyed the household in this way. It never occurs to him that he's actually responsible for his own moral lax lapses. He simply knows that he's hurt her. What bothers him is that he's hurt someone he loves. He does love Dolly. He has no hostile feelings about Dolly and he wishes she hadn't been hurt. He wishes she hadn't found that note. He doesn't wish that he hadn't had an affair with the governess. He really wishes he hadn't left that note on her dressing table. Um, so, and he really wishes he hadn't made that stupid smile. So those are the things he accuses himself of. On the other hand, he's, a, he's supremely good natured. It's hard for me to um, dislike Steva. And in this, in this Set, I'll call it a class. Um, we're not going to talk about the word likability. That's something that comes up all the time in discussions of novels. It kind of irritates me um, because it suggests a, a kind of a, a superficial um, connection to a character. I don't care whether a character is likable or not. King Lear is not likable, but he is a great tragic hero because he comes to, a, he's, he's incredibly arrogant and self serving and, and in fact cruel. But because he, he has a great soul who comes to understand himself, finds self-knowledge, he is a man for whom we feel compassion. So compassion is a word that I find much more useful talking about characters in novels. And Tolstoy is actually one of the great masters of compassion. So, um, so what Steva is, uh, is someone who is full of human failings, but Tolstoy presents those failings and presents Steva as someone who is supremely um, familiar. Uh, Tolstoy writes about him as though Tolstoy himself has done all these things. And he does, he writes about him as though we have done those things. We have smiled when we shouldn't have smiled. We have left something on the table that we shouldn't have left. We have done something that hurts someone and we've regretted it afterwards. And we think of ourselves as good people, no matter what our lapses have been. We all think of ourselves as good people. And so Tolst Tolstoy reminds us of that with Steva. So he starts out the book, this is a, not a book about Steva Oblonsky and his wife. It is a book about Anna Karenina, but he starts off the book 
fret to one side. And he does that again and again, so that the way he introduces Levin is off stage. Somebody comes in and shuts a door. And we don't know who it is until we find out afterwards. It was Levin. Anna is introduced through a telegram. Um, so Steva starts off the book, but he's not the main character. But Tolstoy has this wonderful oblique sort of diagonal means of progression that carries us into a scene before we know we're there. So he starts off by presenting us with someone, an adulterer, an absolute died in the wool adulterer. We know it from the very beginning, the first paragraph, someone for whom we are asked to have compassion. And that's something that is going to recur in this book. This idea that you can have compassion. Tolstoy asks you to have compassion um, for people who are morally um, questionable or, or who are lacking in morals. But he also asks you what morality is. So, okay, um, tremendous velocity in this scene. It, it just whizzes us through all sorts of turbulence, activity. He dispenses with dialogue. We don't have to hear what the governess said or the cook. It's just, he lays it all out in that first opening paragraph. Ab absence of exposition and emotional turbulence. Everything in those first, in those first seven pages is about feeling, about pe pe people acting based on feeling. It's all emotional, it's high drama. Um, and I want you to think about the narrator in this book. So, because somebody is telling us this story. Somebody is saying um, all happy families are alike. Who is that? Who is that voice? And think of other voices that you may know. Think of Flaubert, think of Thackeray, think of Trollope, think of Dickens. These are very worldly voices that have a definite point of view about their characters. Flaubert, for example, was very fond of saying, although I don't think he was being truthful to himself, but he was fond of saying that he despised all his characters. He didn't, but if he had, we wouldn't be still reading Madame Bovary. But he, he is fond of, of taking a condescending tone towards his characters. Um, Trollope is kind of kindly and worldly. Dickens often makes fun of his characters. But this voice does not make fun of the characters. This voice starts out telling us about someone who is supremely flawed, supremely morally questionable, but he does not judge. So this voice is benevolent to a degree that it is almost inhuman. This is the voice of God. This is a, this is a voice that understands and accepts human failure. So we start off in an incredible position in this book. It, we start off uh, with the engine of emotion driving the book, and we start off really with God as our guide. This is, this is a, a, a consciousness that does not judge the characters. It's kind of incredibly liberating. It's not like any other book that had been written at that time. Um, so, okay, um, one other thing, this is on page eight. This is one of my favorite things in the book and it, it suggests Pushkin to me. Um, this is when Stepan is, is inside his study and he's remind, remembering how, what a jerk he's been. And he hears uh, um, two children's voices. Stepan Arkadyevich re recognized the voices of Grisha, the youngest boy, and Tanya, the eldest girl, were heard outside the door. They were pulling something and tipped it over. I told you not to put passengers on the roof, the girl shouted in English. Now pick it up. So what I love about this, again, is the absence of exposition. He requires us to infer what's happening. We get it. Two kids are playing train. They've put something, they put a box and they're pushing it around. He doesn't tell us. He just gives us the sounds and what the kids are saying. And he makes us enter into that, that scene and envision it for ourselves. And when he does that, when he, he requires us to enter into the scene and make it up for ourselves, we create that image. He doesn't do it for us. We create what, was, what we're looking at. Um, he engages us, he draws us in, we become complicit. We're collaborators in this book because we're already, we're already, we've already entered into it, we're already helping him write it. 
we've written that scene, we know what it looks like. So that's just be aware that he does that. He writes something with such spareness that you become his collaborator, which draws you into it and makes you love him, makes me love him anyway. Okay, so there's that. Um, then we, 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 we um, are introduced, we're introduced to all the major characters in this, in the first, um, first 20 or 30 pages. Um, Dolly, we learn only through her emotional responses. We don't know how old she is. We don't know. Um, we have a sense of what she looks like because of Steva's very unkind characterization. She's, she's no longer beautiful. Her hair is thin because she's had seven children. Um, but it's her response that makes her vivid. She's shattered by what her husband has done. She's, her world has been destroyed. And Tolstoy, be aware of the Russian response to emotion. Tolstoy, throughout this book, Tolstoy gives us scenes in which people are, are driven by the most powerful, passionate feelings. And it's not like English literature and it's not like French literature. These people, they weep, Steva weeps, they kiss each other, the men kiss each other on the lips. The serfs and, and the mujiks too, when, when uh, I think this is at Levin's or maybe it's Dolly, it's um, Kitty's family. They use um, a tradition in which the servant would kiss the master on the shoulder, which is a very strange kind of discomforting gesture, but um, it just reminds you of how much physical connection there is in this world. So um, emotion and passion drives this book and it's in, it's in every scene. Um, so on, then we have the introduction of Anna. And it's interesting to note that Anna's, the first appearance of Anna is on page five and it's off stage and she uh, arrives in the guise of a telegram um, that Matt Fay, the servant brings in um, to Steva. And um, he opens the, so this is on page four, Steva opening the telegram, he read it and his face brightened. Matt Fay, my sister, Anna Arkadyevna is coming tomorrow, he said. Thank God, said Matvey, showing by this answer that he understood the significance of this arrival in the same way as his master. That is that Anna Arkadyevna, Donald Kimmelman should help us with this, trans, this um, um, pronunciation. Stepan's beloved sister might contribute to the reconciliation of husband and wife. So Anna is brought in kind of as a marriage counselor. She is the person who is going to mend this broken marriage that has been broken by someone's adulterous liaison. So that's the introduction that we have to Anna. As I say, she's off stage. And Levin, we meet um, when he comes in the wrong door at a moment when he's not expected at Stepan's office. Again, um, he's He's introduced by the things that we come to know about Levin. He's awkward, he's confused, he's confusing. He's never a sort of a, a, a normal um, guest at any kind of gathering. He always does the wrong thing. Um, so step, Levin comes in a, sort of in an oblique way. And, um, So uh, very awkward. And then the introduction of Vronsky um, comes in on page 14 and that's when Levin is telling Steva, Steva that he hopes to um, ask Kitty to marry him. And Steva, feel, Steva feels obliged to tell Levin about Vronsky and, Vron and Levin's face turns spiteful and unhappy. So, um, we have a sense again of what Vronsky means in this in this um, community. Whatever it is, it's going to cause pain to somebody. So we have the characters brought in um, in ways that are interesting and um, complicated. Again, there is no sort of straightforward march of the characters the way you would find in Trollope or Dickens, um, both of whom. Tolstoy had read, by the way, he loved both of them. 
Um, so they all come in and one of my favorite moments is the introduction of Anna. And I will remind you of that. That's on page 61 and 62. And we've been told that um, Steve is waiting for her with great relief because he trusts that she will be able to fix the huge problem that he's made. Um, but we haven't seen her. We don't know anything about Anna until Vronsky sees her on this is page 61. Vronsky goes to meet his mother who's come on the train from Petersburg. And um, Vronsky determined with one glance that the lady belonged to high society. He felt a need to, uh, to glance at her once more, not because she was very beautiful, though we, are to, we understand that she was, not because of the elegance and modest great, grace that could be seen in her whole figure, but because there was something especially gentle and tender in the expression of her sweet looking face as she stepped past him. As he looked back, she also turned her head. Her shining gray eyes, which she seemed dark because of their thick lashes, rested aim amiably and attentively on his face. In that brief glance, Vronsky had time to notice the restrained animation that played over her face and fluttered between her shining eyes and the barely noticeable smile that curved her red lips. It was as, though, as if a surplus of something so overflowed her being that ex it expressed itself beyond her will. Now in the brightness of her glance, now in her smile. She deliberately extinguished the light in her eyes, but it shone against her will in a barely noticeable smile. So what we know about Anna so far is an enormous sense of vitality and also sweetness and modesty. And we learn um, quite soon that she was incredibly generous, that she sat up all night talking to an older woman that she didn't know. Um, and she was so kind to the woman, Vronsky's mother, that um, the, Vronsky's mother says, I'm in love with you. You are wonderful to me. So you have the sense that she is a woman of great elegance and great beauty, but also great generosity of spirit. And that's why she's here. She's here to help her brother who needs her. One of my favorite things about Anna is the description on page 62, when she sees her brother, she's waiting for him um, in the train. Madame Karenina did not wait for her brother, but on seeing him got out of the carriage with a light resolute step. And as soon as her brother came up to her, she threw her left arm around his neck in a movement that surprised Vronsky by its resoluteness and grace, quickly drew him to her, her and gave him a hearty kiss. Vronsky, not taking his eyes away, looked at her and smiled, himself not knowing at what. But that gesture, which is so charming and so bold and it's um, so uncontained, so, um, so free in this open public space, she's wait, there are strangers all around, there are porters, there's the station master, and she walks up and she puts her left arm up and wraps it around Steva's neck and kisses him. So again, you have a sense of a woman who is um, not bounded by the rules of society. She'll do this wonderful, charming, intimate gesture in public. She's full of energy, full of a kind of overflowing, she's overflowing with a kind of vitality. So that's what we know about Anna at the beginning. Um, so he sets the scene with these, with these wonderful characters and he starts off with, a, with a, this theme that we're going to um, see repeated over and over of the questions of marriage, of adultery, of family and morality. Um, I want to read you another brief passage because one of the things that Pushkin does remember is um, introduce the idea of these fairy tales and a kind of a romantic and semi-magical countryside in which people there, as I say, they were galloping horses and midnight trysts and abandoned wives, I mean, brides and um, uh, people 
challenging each other to duels. And they're, and they're also sort of magic. There's magic in Pushkin. Pushkin. They're, they're magical. The queen of spades has magical spells in it. So he's aware of this notion of enchantment. And I would, I would argue that there is a strain of enchantment in this book that he draws on. And it's not specifically magic. He never says in any, there's a magic spell, but he casts these, um, he writes these scenes in which we feel an enchantment kind of being set up. So one of them is um, when Anna goes home with Steva and of course that's where she's staying and um, they all have dinner and she has started to fix um, to fix this this family this this rift that has occurred in the family between Dolly and Steva um, but she she takes the opportunity towards 10 o'clock at night late so the evening is mostly over she leaves the, the the group of people in the living room and she this is the time when she usually said good night to her son and she felt sad to be so far from him and she wants to look at his picture and talk about him. Taking advantage of the first pretext, she got up and with her light resolute step, she went to fetch the album. The stairs that led up to her room began on the landing of the big heated front stairway. So imagine this, this big townhouse in Moscow with an, a, a door that opens onto a downstairs hall and then a staircase going up to the second floor, which is heated. Just as she was leaving the drawing room, there was a ring at the door. Who could that be? said Dolly. It's too early for me and too late for anyone else, observed Kitty. Someone would come and pick Kitty up because she was, she couldn't go around unchaperoned. Probably someone with papers, Stepan put in. And as Anna was crossing the landing, a servant came running up the stairs to announce the visitor. While the visitor himself stood by the lamp, Anna, looking down, at once recognized Vronsky, and a strange feeling of pleasure suddenly stirred in her heart, together with a fear of something. He stood without removing his coat and was taking something from his pocket. Just as she reached the center of the landing, he raised his eyes, saw her, and something ashamed and frightened appeared in his expression. Inclining her head slightly, she went on, and behind her heard the loud voice of Stepan, inviting him to come in, and the soft, gentle, and calm voice of Vronsky declining. So that moment, which takes place outside the social norm, everyone else is in the drawing room, they're having tea, and they're talking, and she's getting an album. That takes place in a separate sort of magical space. The two of them alone, he appears, he says nothing. They say nothing to each other, but their eyes meet. And it is like a scene in a fairy tale. Tolstoy makes it very clear that this meeting has an enormous emotional power. So that engine gets started. We've already understood that Vronsky was very much drawn to her. And she recognizes at the train station when he's, he offers money to the family of the person who was the, the worker who was killed by the train, she understands that he did that because of her, whom he's just met. But he wants to reveal to her the, the core of himself as a man. He wants to show that he is generous, that he is noble, and that he does this, he does this without, without revealing himself. It's revealed by the station master, but she understands that he did it for her. So that's the gesture that he made. And then he makes this second gesture coming to the house at night. And it sets up this, this sense of, a, of a, an erotic spell. Um, that is continued when Kitty and Anna and Vronsky are all together at the ball. And we know what happens at that terrible, ill-fated ball. And poor Kitty has her heart set on that ball as, as being the culmination of her relationship with Vronsky. And instead, it is the time in which Vronsky and 
Anna publicly fall in love with each other in front of the whole gathering. Anna looking ravishingly beautiful in a black dress, um, which again is sort of the, the, um, the color of enchantment, this woman in a black dress. She's like a fairy godmother. Um, so this is on page 83. Um, she, Kitty saw that they felt themselves alone in this crowded ballroom. And on Vronsky's face, always so firm and independent, she saw that expression of lostness and obedience that had so struck her, like the expression of an intelligent dog when it feels guilty. He's fallen under a spell. Anna smiled and her smile passed over to him. She lapsed into thought and he too would turn serious. Some supernatural force drew Kitty's eyes to Anna's face. She was enchanting in her simple black dress, her firm neck with its string of pearls, enchanting her curly hair in disarray, enchanting the graceful light movements of her small feet and hands, enchanting that beautiful face in its animation. But there was something terrible and cruel in her enchantment. So there we see Anna, who, we, who to whom we've been introduced as a kind of a, the goddess of mercy, the goddess of marriage, um, the woman who spends all night talking to someone, to an older stranger, a woman who puts her left hand around her brother's neck to give him comfort and, and show her affection, who has now become a kind of a magical presence, a cruel enchantress. Um, and we're reminded of Steva, who didn't mean to hurt anyone, who wishes he had not hurt anyone. So Anna finds herself in this position of being enchanting, whether or not she intended it. And the next part I want to read is another moment of enchantment, which is Anna on the train to Petersburg. She leaves early in order to evade this enchantment that, that, has, that has taken place, this magic spell that's happened. And um, she's on the train and she's sort of having an, a hallucin an hallucination. Um, she, let's see, where should I start? Um, she was unable to understand what she was reading. She passed the paper knife over the glass then put its smooth and cold surface to her cheek and nearly laughed aloud from the joy that suddenly came over her for no reason. She felt her nerves tighten more and more like strings on winding pegs. Pegs. She felt her eyes open wider and wider, her fingers and toes move nervously. Something inside her stopped her breath, and all images and sounds in that wavering semi-darkness impressed themselves on her with extraordinary vividness. She kept having moments of doubt whether the carriage was moving forwards or backwards or standing still. And then she um, she stands up and comes to her senses, realizing that they have arrived at a station. Are you going out? Asked Anushka, that's her maid. Everyone, practically every woman in the book is called Anna or Anushka, I don't know why, but um, yes, I need a breath of fresh air. It's very hot in here. And she opened the door. Blizzard and wind came tearing to meet her and vied with her for the door. This too, she found exhilarating. She opened the door and went out. The wind, as if only waiting for her, whistled joyfully and wanted to pick her up and carry her off. But she grasped the cold post firmly and holding her dress down, stepped onto the platform and into the lee of the carriage. The wind was strong on the steps, but on the platform behind the, beside the train, it was quiet. With pleasure, she drew in deep breaths of the snowy, frosty air and standing by the carriage, looked around the platform and the lit up station. Um, and she breathed in once, I'm skipping, she breathed in once more to get her fill of air and had already taken her hand from her muff to grasp the post and go into the carriage. When near her, another man in a military greatcoat screened her from the wavering light of the lantern. 
She turned and in the same moment recognized the face of Vronsky. Putting his hand to his visor, he bowed to her and asked if she needed anything, if he might be of service to her. She peered at him for quite a long time without answering. And though he was standing in the shadow, she could see or thought she could see the expression of his face and eyes. It was again, that expression of respectful admiration that, that had so affected her yesterday. In that first moment of meeting him, she was overcome by a feeling of joyful pride. She had no need to ask why he was there. She knew it as certainly as if he had told her that he was there in order to be where she was. I didn't know you were going. Why are you going? She said. Why am I going? He repeated, looking straight into her eyes. You know, I am going to be, I'm going in order to be where you are. He said, I cannot do otherwise. So again, the two of them are set in this magical space outside the rest of the world. No one else is witness to this. No one else is present. Present, it's in this, the lee of this wild snowstorm. Emotion is being expressed by the weather and they are, they are taking shelter at that moment. And he expresses to her what's going to take over her life. Her life. He is there for her. Is there anything I can offer you, he says. You have a husband, a household, a married life. Can I offer you something else? Can I offer you myself? It is one of the most romantic passages, I think, in all of literature, this wonderful scene with Vronsky, who shelters her from a snowstorm. Um, be aware that Anna is fleeing Vronsky. She leaves Petersburg, uh, she leaves Moscow early in order to make sure that this never happens. And being found on the platform in some way releases her almost from her own promise, her own sense of morality and integrity. This is not something that she has any intention of continuing with. She didn't mean to do it, but she also can't stop the fact that her nerves are strung so tight um, as though they're on pegs. The fact that her heart is racing, that her blood is pounding in her temples because of what's happening to her. So there's this sense of enchantment that Tolstoy weaves over this opening, this part one, in which Anna and Vronsky meet and are caught up in something that is greater than they are. Okay, so that is most of what I have to say about this opening. Um, I want you to think about whether or not this is a novel of ideas, that's, that's a phrase that is used about novels that are great. Is it a novel of ideas or emotions? Um, and also, as you read this book, be aware of, the, of these themes, marriage and adultery, family and morality, but also be aware of the enormous reach of Tolstoy's mind and the sense of questioning that he uh, uses to address the world. So these are things that concern him and they are many of them abstract and not personal. Philosophy and religion and social poli policy. Um, he's interested in the abstract and the particular. Um, he's, he's interested in the way politicians think and the way children are fed. He gives great respect to every character. He feels a sense of empathy. You never feel once you enter into one of Tolstoy's, the mind, the consciousness of one of Tolstoy's characters, that you're being invited to judge him or to think less of him or her because of the way he feels or she feels. So he offers this kind of um, sacred space in which each character is given a place to exist in her own right or in his own right. So be aware of that enormous, the, the enormous luxury of being guided by someone who does not judge, who sympathizes with the character. Okay, so now I'm going to look at the chat and see what your questions are. And I won't be able to um, answer all of them. 
you know, I'm being told how to how to pronounce it. Ar Ar Anna Arkadyevna. Arkadyevna. Anna Arkadyevna. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry about the page numbers. I didn't. Um, I thought I had um, given the, the page numbers to everyone. Okay, here's somebody who tells me that kissing the master on the shoulder also happens in Saudi Arabia. That is great. Thank you. That's Ellen Warner. Um, and be aware as we read this book of those, those um, moments in the text that remind us of the Asian character of Russia as well as the European, the speaking French. But very often you will see something like so and so is wearing a caftan which is not a European, not European dress. And European dress was introduced relatively late to Russia. People wore robes as they did in China and, and um, places further East. And one of the Asians, <laughs> those moments of Asia and Europe being um, uh, juxtaposed with each other takes place and it always makes me laugh. When Levin arrives in Steva's office and he is disgusted by one of Steva's colleagues who has long fingernails, long curved yellow fingernails. And that's a, um, a characteristic that was, that was um, part of Chinese culture and um, upper class Chinese people would have um, fingernail guards to keep their fingernails to break, from breaking. And it demonstrated the fact that they never did manual labor. This person was never um, shoveling out the, the cow shed. Um, he had these wonderful long nails and Levin is disgusted by it and is so enraged by it. That's, that's one of the ways, the early si signals that we get about Le Levin's inability to um, forgive anybody from do for doing anything he doesn't like. So he's disgusted by these long nails. Steva thinks it's funny. Steva doesn't judge his colleague for having long nails, but Levin can't stand it. Um, so, but be aware of those, those moments in which we are reminded of the um, the Asian nature of the Russian culture. Um, so somebody says, don't we know that Dolly's 32? Okay, yes, thank you. One year younger than her husband. They've been married for nine years. We do, we infer that, but we have to figure that out from the number of children she has. I'm just saying we are, we are given information about the characters. I'm just saying that Tolstoy doesn't unroll it the way Dickens or Trollope might do, do with, um, with that kind of uh, exposition that we're accustomed to. Um, someone says, Christina Ascuna says, it sounds as if Tolstoy had to work his way towards a su suspension of judgment when it came to Anna. Um, we're going to see how he uh, feels about Anna. And I think that he does work his way. I mean, there are times when he feels one way about Anna and times when he feels another. And I can tell you that when in the original, not necessarily draft, but his original intentions show that the original, his original idea of Anna was that she was going to be older, heavy and vulgar. And that as he wrote the book, he came to want her to be a different kind of person and was somebody who um, he did feel closer to and, and more compassionate and sympathetic towards. Um, so somebody says, if Count Vronsky comes off quite negative to, negatively to me in this part, you know what, I'm gonna unmute everyone. So, I mean, can I do that? Or can somebody do that for um, me? Char, I'll do, do that, that for you, Roxana. Yep, I'll do that. So um, if, you, if you, I think we, we should have, be able to talk about these things. Um, so Vronsky, Ron, so Anne Trowbridge says, Count Vronsky comes off quite negatively to me in this part, almost exactly the person smart Anna would not run off with. Um, so Vronsky, I think is a cipher. It's hard to figure out how Tolstoy feels about him. Um, we hear a lot about his teeth, for example, which is really not a, um, a part of his character. And you wonder why Tolstoy spends time doing that. We're told by, um, Kitty and Dolly's father, they, who calls him a, a fop from Petersburg. Um, Anna calls him a young officer as though she's being dismissive. I, I've read this book many, many times. I've never been able to find out for sure a passage that suggests Ronsky is younger than Anna. 
but I often feel that he's meant to be, maybe not by much. And maybe it's just that she has a child and that she has, has been running a household for years and she is more settled and has more understanding of um, what it's like to be a settled person in society. But you have this sense that he is slightly younger and more irresponsible than Anna is. Mm -hmm. um, but but it, you do feel that, um, that, Vronsky, that Tolstoy is really trying to figure out who Vronsky is. He doesn't want to make him into a cad, um, but he's somebody who is so handsome, so rich, so, um, so um, successful in his career that it's hard to find a way into his character the way we have with Dolly, the way we have with Steva, the way we have with Anna, all of whom revealed, have revealed themselves through um, sort of riveting and very human gestures and behavior, yeah. weeping or hugging and doing things. And Vronsky is, is more reserved and the way he behaves at that party mm. and with the table turning, he, he's cool. Um, and we respect him, but we really don't get to know uh, Vronsky in this section, the way we get to know the other characters. We aren't given a way inside him. Roxana? Yes. Hi, Robin. Oh, I, um, just that you say that is interesting because I sort of experience him as moving sort of like a spirit. Like I don't see, I, I mean, it's it's true that we get this information about his teeth and, but I feel he's more like um, just as you said, that sort of in that mystical quality, I feel like he sort of moves oh. in. He tries to get away from him and he, he, he he's less embodied than he is sort of a, mo a movement. Does that make sense? He definitely moves in. And um, one of the things that distinguishes Vronsky from the other characters, all the other characters we've been introduced to are deeply engaged by family life. Mm -hmm. Dolly is, Steva is, even though he's destroying his family, he is very engaged by it. And he thinks he sh it could, should continue. Um, Anna is, so uh, Kitty is, Kitty wants to be married. Her parents are very, are very engaged by each other. Vronsky, we are told, had never known family life. That's the first and the most powerful thing we know about Vronsky. So he is an outsider to all the mores that guide the, uh, the other people. Stephen knows he shouldn't be doing what he's doing. Vronsky doesn't seem to have any moral understanding. And then we're told that he barely knew his father. He barely knew his mother. He was brought up in the core of cadets. And so he's, he's, He's really out, even though he's very much a part of St. Petersburg society and he's very much a presence, everyone knows him, he's mm -hmm. distinguished, but he also doesn't seem to know the rules. He wasn't given a sense of family. We remember that about Tolstoy himself. We remember that he lost his parents very young um, and he was just moved from pillar to post. So he also was sort of brought up without a guiding light, people saying, You mustn't. If you're paying attention to a young girl, you must, after a certain period, you must ask her to marry, ask her to marry you. Um, no one is telling him that. And we learn, actually, this is a very bad sign. We le learn that his mother was famously adulterous and had lots of affairs before her husband's death and after. So he comes to us with a kind of dark shadow, a, a moral shadow. But um, among his own regiment, he is a man of honor and a man that everyone respects and admires. So it's it, it, Tolstoy is kind of giving us a mixed message. You're absolutely right that he is he is the the person who takes charge and um, takes action here. He follows Anna. She leaves, and he goes after her. And we can feel this the relentlessness and the determination of his presence and his action. Roxana, can I say something about Bronsky? Yes, please. This is yeah, it. Uh, lived in Russia, so he's our expert. Well, I'm, I, I've I've read the whole book, so I you know I'm, I'm looking forward to. It, but I, I have I have more sympathy oh, for. Just remember, everyone. There's some people. I, I, I know, but but I, I have I have sympathy for Bronsky. If you just think in this first part, uh, you know, he goes back to a life that he actually loves. Anna goes back to a life that she hates. 
so he's he's having a fine time, and uh, once he gets back with his with his gang and the gossip, and you know who knows where they're going to go drinking and whoring and all of that. Uh, so he's a guy who was having a great life, and then got in over his head. Uh, as she got in over her head, he got in over his head. Yeah, we haven't cut. We haven't gotten to that part. Yes, but as, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> He's in an entirely different context. He said marriage had never presented itself as a possibility for him. I mean, he, that whole arena is not something that he's, you know, concerned with. Yeah. No, and and but he, I mean, he, he has he's he's led a life with the gypsies basically, with gypsies and prostitutes, and the woman that that woman who's trying to get divorced when he who's in his house when he gets home. So he's living a life outside society. So those societal strictures don't mean anything to him. Um, and yet, he spent months, we're told, um, after Levin left Moscow, he went to Moscow and presented himself over and over to Kitty's, into Kitty's household. So it's kind of mysterious why he doesn't understand what he's doing. That was part of a very old fashioned, traditional um, society in Moscow that he was part of. It's also hard to figure out exactly what his duties are as, a, as an officer. He seems to go wherever he wants as long as he wants. Um, so he was in Moscow for months uh, attending to Kitty and then he goes back to Petersburg. Um, but he, he can live his whole life um, like, like Levin's brother without ever marrying, without ever having a settled life, but just having prostitutes and, and the gypsies and that, that would be his life. And that would be a possibility, right, for an officer to live that life. I mean, nobody would look tw think twice mm -hmm. about it. He could do that, yeah. yeah. I think he acts like a stalker. He acts like a stalker? Yes. I, th I think he's a predator. Ooh. Well, that is definitely, there's definitely, that's one way to look at him. I mean, he, goes, he goes after Anna. I think it's kind of creepy for him to turn up at the train, for example. Uh, I love it. <laughs> we're kind of we're he's kind of only, cold. He's the only one that knows his mind by the end. He's he's a good guy. He's a frat boy who turns into a good guy. He's definitely a frat boy. Yeah, but hey, a frat boy. Okay, we'll see. We'll see more of his actions and his behaviors. But right now, he's yeah. All of those things are true. He is kind of stalkerish. At but this anyway, point. Yeah. At the point we were, I, I got the impression that we were told that he um, was of the mind that, you know, this one ma married one woman was just kind of not the thing for him. And his whole group in St. Petersburg was basically you know, like the party boys, yeah, the frat boys kind of thing with no consequences. And I think, um, I don't understand in some of these writings where women, they're mostly at home or they're at home with their families, waiting for the knock on the door for the guy to come. He winks and blinks, they talk once or twice and they're madly in love. I think that's kind of weird. Um, you know, people are happy, they're not happy, but that's how it works. But um, I think he was just after Anna with no consequences in mind at this point in the book. You know, he just wanted what he wanted and off he goes. No, he's really in love with her and he remains in love with her. And as the book goes on, he puts up with all her. Well, wait, 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 we're not gonna, we're not gonna no, talk no, about no, far along at this We're not gonna talk about anything but part one here. If people don't know the ending mm -hmm. of this, I don't know why they're yeah. even. <laughs> well, we have to not gonna make assumptions. I am. There's some um, Roxanne, I have a question. Um, can I, I this is Ginny. Um, I just wanted to ask if you know anything about how he wrote it, how many drafts he went through, because I think some of what we're touching on are things that are in the first section that have resonance and echoes later. And you know, we, re we respect, you know, assume that's because obviously he wrote this many times, but I'm also kind of curious because it flows in such a way that I can almost imagine him just sort of, um, sort of spewing it out, out in a certain way. Um, do you know anything about his process for writing it? Um, um, anyway, he, yeah. Yeah, he, he had a hard time writing this book and he, he started out, as I say, thinking it was going to be a different kind of book, that it was going to be about a, a a woman you did not feel sympathy for who was having it, 
an affair. Um, but he, and he stopped and started it several times. Um, and I think, and he also, the reason he wrote it was that he needed some money to buy a piece of land, 2000 acres or something, which is really why all the novels get, the great novels are written. It's mostly because of people wanting to buy land. Um, but <laughs> so he started it and then stopped it, put it down and then picked it up again and did change it. I, I don't know about how many drafts there were. Um, I do know that his wife, Sonia, he would write um, all night and he would write a, in longhand and then his wife would decipher his handwriting and write a fair copy. Mm -hmm. So she was sort of part of yeah. it, a part of the creative process. Because it's so, there's certain things that are in this first section I'm not going to say anything else, but there's certain things that echo later and have a really great importance, certain themes Absolutely. and um, even details. And, you know, and so that makes you think, oh, it's, it has to have been a lot of drafts. But on the other hand, I was totally picturing him handwriting it and just sort of wondering what that process was. He did handwrite it. And, mm -hmm. and um, he wrote it, I think this, he, I know that he did this at, about War and Peace. He wrote it for, um, it was serialized. And so he, so he, you know, he, it's, this is the house of mirth. It was the same thing. So she, the first chapters were written and published before wow. he could go back and rewrite the whole, you know, write the second draft basically. And he was writing it chapter by chapter and sending it off to the publisher and it would come out. So Amazing. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it, it kind of ah. <laughs> that makes it even wilder, like more incredible. <laughs> Excuse me, Jerry. I, I, it's my understanding that it took him ten years actually to complete this work, and that I also had heard. I don't know how, whether this is true or not. That the book was actually on the press, and it was ready to be printed, and he stopped the process because he was so dissatisfied with with it. And so he came back and rewrote it. I, I, I don't know, is that right, Roxana, or not? Um, it may have, it was, it was a number of years. I, I didn't think it was 10 years. I'll, I'll, I'll get my biography and read the, the details. But um, as I say, it was published serially. So the, the, the big question was the ending and it's not the ending of these characters. It's a, it's a sort of a political coda that he added to the original book. And that was a subject of enormous controversy. And it was published by one publication and taken out of another. And he was furious and he said, it has to be in there. And when you read it, you'll see, I mean, it's a, it's a long sort of expository um, piece. Part of it is action and part of it is politics. And you can decide for yourselves whether it belongs in the book or not. Mm -hmm. I found it interesting that uh, your comment about it being uh, serialized and perhaps <laughs> After serialization, he edited it again for a full publication. And um, I have no idea if that is true or not, but one of, the, one of the things I noticed immediately by reading the book again is how short the chapters are. Mm -hmm. And what a relief it is to know that they're only that long. So that you, can, you don't get caught in the middle of something where you have to, you know, you, you get to good, bite-sized pieces so that if you uh, decide to get another couple of chapters in as you're getting ready to go to sleep, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's a very appealing aspect of this book. Mm -hmm. you, can, mm -hmm. you wouldn't want to read a 25 page chapter, but you can easily mm -hmm. read a 25 page chapter. Hey, um, just as uh, my cast here, can I make a comment? Yeah. Uh, I would well we were talking about morality and and some people walking outside or operating outside the context of conventional morality I found it very interesting that the princess herself the mom of the three daughters was musing during uh, Kitty's uh, her last daughter's uh, back and forth and betrayal. she was going over how all the mores have changed and like it was unclear how you marry somebody off anymore. The old French way was being poo-pooed, the Russian way was being laughed at, the English way of complete freedom, the Russians didn't like. So she herself, as part of the landed aristocracy, realized that big changes were going on and that there were, she actually said, hey, it seems like right now there are no rules. Yeah, 
it's, it's a great passage. Um, uh, and it's sort of, it's, it's reflected in every um, book about marriage in the 19th century. It's kind of, oh, the, the old ways were better. And now these young, young people are, do whatever they feel like. And how are we going to stop it? And it's, it's all a nightmare. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm glad you drew, drew our attention to that. It's a great I, I have a comment things. about Levin. <laughs> yeah. Levin. I'm uh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, I was uh, very um, impressed by the going back and forth with Levin on, oh, I'm terrible. I'm awful. I can't be this way. I have to change. And then Oh, I'm okay. Okay, I'm changing. And then he gets home, and it's like, oh no, I'm okay the way I am. And it seemed to me that that sort of psychological drifting was no. not common at that time. So one of the things about Tolstoy is um, his absolute determination to find the truth of things. Authenticity is an enormously important to him. So we'll find that throughout the book. He's always challenging people and situations in order to find the truth about it. And Levin, whom we can read as a kind of counterpart to Tolstoy, is somebody who is constantly seeking the truth about something and changing his mind, as you say. And, and if there's anyone in the book that, that Tolstoy mocks, it's Levin. And we'll, we'll see that so that, so that Levin um, comes in at the wrong moment at St in Steve's office, he comes in through a door he shouldn't have gone in and Porter shows him out. And that it's very awkward when he arrives. Um, and he, he switches his feelings constantly and wildly he swings back and forth, as you say. And Levin's emotional and intellectual um, quests are one of the things that drive this book. And he is a man of enormous passion and enormous feelings. And so his feelings, when they take over, really illuminate the landscape. And we'll see there two, there, there's a wonderful time when he, the entire uh, landscape of Moscow is transformed by Levin's feelings at that moment. Everyone in Moscow becomes a part of this drama that he's creating through his emotions. So he is, um, he is kind of the, the questing figure. He is constantly testing things and asking um, how, where the core is, where the source of authenticity is. So when he's um, listening to his brother, the famous intellectual, talk to another philosopher, he really doesn't care what they talk about. He's interested in how they relate to each other. That's what for him is the important part. It's this the authenticity of human connection. So over and over again, he will set aside politics or, or, or religion or these questions that are raised. What he cares about is how people relate to each other, if they're true to themselves. And that comes up that over sense. and over. And, and yeah. for Levin, it's, um, he is he is a weathercock, as you say. He goes back and forth. He feels strongly about this, and then his his um his feelings collapse, and he he feels he can never succeed. So um, that that's part of the 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 emotional um, vitality of this book is Levin's wild, unbounded um, emotional swivels swivels. <laughs> Roxana, Linda English uh, in New London. Um, would you care to comment uh, about Levin's dog, Laska, ah. in, <laughs> in showing some empathy? <laughs> I'm a dog person, so I always look for the dogs. Um, we haven't gotten there yet, but that's one of my fa great favorite passages in the book. And I have a lot to say about that. I'm glad, oh, yeah. I'm glad you raised it and we'll look forward to talking more about it. <laughs> Roxana. I just wanted to ask, and I apologize if you if you mentioned this um, after I left last week. Can you, can you say something about the epigram, vengeance is mine, I will repay? It's a really challenging um, phrase. And I've, I've taught this book many times and each, each year students have different things to say about it. Um, we're gonna talk about it at the end. Okay. Um, when the, the arc is complete, but it's, it's really, it's really, um, it's not immediately evident what he's saying. 
but I'm glad you raised it. We'll talk about it again. And then just one other thing. I, thank you. I, I um, just in terms of what you said about that, Tolstoy is not judge judgmental. He 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 does mock Levin, um, but it's mm -hmm. so interesting mm -hmm. that the, that the novel begins with the consequences, not of not of the main characters, but of the consequences of what happens when someone steps outside of. It. So it's a not it's a the narrator is not judgmental, but we're given this scene that just shows us, not even really in a terrible way ultimately, but just what happens when, when people deviate from, so it's interesting, yeah. Very, as I say, he's, he's setting, setting up this scenario that we will examine later with different characters, but he's setting it up um, with a character who is, um, morally questionable, as I said, but he's asking mm -hmm. us to sympathize with that character, to empathize with him. And um, he's setting up a, a series of questions for himself, really, about morality and about honor mm -hmm. and, and what it means to be honorable. He was a very fair haired guy. Yeah. Roxana. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, a, a very basic question. Can you give us an outline of their meal times? Oh, good question. <laughs> I was just, I, I love what, tracking things like that and figuring out, I mean, there's one phase in which, um, I can't remember if it's this book, but they talk about eating at five o'clock and I couldn't figure, I really couldn't figure out from the context it was five in the, five in the morning or five in the afternoon. Anyway, there is, I just marked it. Um, so Steva comes down to, to have dinner. They have dinner at five mm -hmm. and he comes down in white tie because he's going on afterwards. So they have a real sit down dinner at five and then, then they go on till two o'clock in the morning doing other things. After dinner, they'll go and move into the other room and, or they'll, they'll go to a dance or they'll uh, play cards and then they'll have a late supper at midnight. So, um, tea. so yeah. A tea and tea. Tea all, tea all the time. There's a samovar as far as Sam at home at eight, nine o'clock in the evening, and then he goes on and on and on and on. Yeah, on and on and on. Yeah. And so there's no rhyme or reason. Okay. I mean, I don't know what lunch what lunch time is. If they have if they have dinner at five, I don't know what time they have lunch. <laughs> <laughs> but I did mark that the dinner time was at five because he says he's going to come back afterward. He's not going to come back for dinner. Um, but he's going to meet her at the train, and the train is at seven. It's an overnight train, so he, he, anyway. At seven at night, or seven? Yeah, seven at night. At night. But, then, but then she tells her to go visit um, um, that woman. That's no, that's when she gets to Petersburg. Is that what yeah? You're right? Yeah, she gets to Petersburg, and she's supposed to do more things. I mean, well, she gets there in the morning. Oh, she okay. It's an overnight train. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, that, that. So yes, I'm glad you asked that. So everybody track this when when <laughs> when they sit down to eat, pay attention to what time it is because it's it's not it's not the schedule that we're used to. Somebody should do a book about it's like when you read the story of the dead and you realize that Gabriel and, and Greta don't arrive until 10, then they dance. <laughs> that they have dinner at like four in the morning or something. But it would be a wonderful project to track these meal times. Yeah, yeah, it's very it it fascinates me. I thought that Tolstoy's writing about women's outfits was extraordinary. And I found myself looking up the Venetian lace that adorned Anna's black gown. And then his image, his descriptions of Kitty, all in pink, the pink <laughs> Kitty. Um, I thought it was kind of incredible for a man to pay granular attention to uh, costumes. Addresses. I quite agree. Um, it seems as though he's inhabiting that body. And, and pay attention to the hair too, because one of the things at this time in Russia was that the use of false hair. So even mm -hmm. Kitty, who is at her most blooming and beautiful and has more hair than she ever will again, is using false braids. It says that. It says that it, yeah. the blonde- Anna hair, isn't. The sorry? Ad Anna isn't. Anna isn't what? Using false braids. Yeah. You're right. You're right. She's She's. She's authentic. She has. Okay. 
But even Kitty, who is also authentic, um, is wearing false braids. So yeah, you have the sense that Tolstoy just notices every single thing there is to notice and, and sympathizes, sympathizes. Yeah. Can I put in a word for Levin, please? Yeah. Uh, Levin wears his emotions on the outside. You know, when Kitty rejects him, he is, he is determined. He's going to be a better person. He's going to do this. He's going to do that. He is self-examining. Whereas, you know, it seems that, um, st is it Stevia? Stevia and Eva. Bronsky, Eva. all the other men are kind of glad handing and smiling and it's all good. And there's no traction with um, the emotions or responsibility for their, their what, the situations, the scenarios that they've created. Now, I'm not saying that Levin is right to turn all this rejection against himself, but, um, and you know, I've read the first hundred pages of Instructed, I haven't read the book in 30 years. So I'm having my own epiphany about how much I've changed or, or how much the book has changed. But I think that Levin is quite fascinating as a character. I totally agree. I totally agree. I mean, he's the person, he has no guardrails. So everybody else in the book has a plan for their lives. They understand how their lives are supposed to go and how other people's lives are supposed to go. He has no idea how his life is supposed to go. He has this idea that he's going to want to, he's going to have a family, but he doesn't know who the wife is going to be. Um, it's all backward. He doesn't know really how to be a farmer, but he has an idea about it. So uh, he's wonderful. He's kind of the, the, the whirlwind that drives his story. His queries, his questions, his quests are, um, keep on expanding our horizons. He keeps asking different questions in different forms. Um, and he asks everything of himself. I mean, that's the appealing thing to me about Levin is he yes. doesn't ask, other, uh, ask things of other people. He expects himself to be the most moral and the most um, dedicated, the most responsible person that it's possible to be. He's constantly failing in his expectations, but that's what he has for himself. He must be the person he longs to be. Everybody yeah. else is happy with themselves. He is never happy with himself. He always yeah. thinks he could do better. So, yeah. so he's, a, he's a very flawed and I find very sympathetic character. Yeah. May I say that I think Tolstoy gives the characters the ability to read each other's faces so well. And mm -hmm. by doing so, we learn a lot more about them than we might from other writers. Like when the skating scenes happen, happens and Levin skates up to her and he sees right away in her face that it's not gonna go well immediately. Like he's much more perceptive than a lot of people I know right <laughs> out of the gate. <laughs> and you see that also um, in the in the beginning with a husband when he sees his wife's face and he sees how much pain she's in. Like right away, they all read each other very accurately and with a lot of, you know, it goes hand in hand with all the emotion that you see going on. They And so by mm -hmm. doing so, we can read the emotion. He doesn't have to tell us because the characters are telling us by seeing each other's faces. That's a really good point. Um, and I think it's part of uh, what I said in the beginning about how these characters, these Russian characters, I don't wanna generalize and say all, all Russians are like this, but these characters are driven by emotion and they do respond to each other's faces. They do pick up on the emotional um, climate in a room and in a conversation enormously powerfully. So we have to assume that Tolstoy may have been more inclined to that than anyone else in the world, <laughs> um, but he, he imbues his character, he endows his characters with that. Isn't that part of what makes the book so great is that actually we all do read each other's faces and we may not admit it, but you can look at someone's face and immediately know this isn't going well or this is gonna be great. <laughs> Some okay. people are better than others at expressing that. <laughs> he, yeah. he does a good job of cluing us in right off the bat. I, I really enjoy that part about it. I yeah. think that uh, uh, what you've just said about reading each other's faces has been one of the things we've lost during COVID. 
uh, that we are unable to read each other's body language, something I miss very much and this book has given me a breath of fresh air about it. Isn't that interesting? I, like that. I like that. I think you're absolutely right. Um, it, it's one of the reasons that we're so indebted to Zoom. At least we can see each other's faces without masks. Yes. And what I said to my students during the, um, this horrible fall semester was we can take refuge in great literature because it takes us somewhere else. Yes. I want to read, I want to close by reading a quote um, that. Tolstoy wrote to another Russian novelist, someone called Bobarikin, whom I've never heard of, and he's not as famous as Tolstoy. And, he's, and Tolstoy was incredibly opinionated, very difficult to keep as a friend because his opinions were so strong and he was so outspoken. And he's telling Bobarikin why his novels are so bad, why Bobarikin's novels are so bad. <laughs> he said, which is always a great opener to your writer friends. Um, both your novels are written on contemporary themes, problems of the Zemtsvo literature and the emancipation of women, etc., obtrude with you in a polemical manner. But these problems are not only not interesting in the world of art, they have no place there at all. Problems of the emancipation of women and of literary parties inevitably appear to you important in your literary Petersburg milieu, snobbery again. But all those problems splash about in a little puddle of dirty water, which only seems like an ocean to those whom fate has set down in the middle of the puddle. The aims of art are incommensurate with social aims. The aim of an artist is not to solve a problem irrefutably, but to make people love life in all its countless inexhaustible manifestations. Hmm. If I were told I could write a novel whereby I might irrefutably establish what seemed to me the correct point of view on all social problems, I would not even devote two hours to such a novel. But if I were to be told that I should write, that what I should write would be read in about 20 years time by those who are now children and that they would laugh and cry over it and love life, I would devote all my own life and all my energies to it. Oh, he sure was successful. Very nice. All right. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. I will see you next week.